follow-up video to my last little rant about being a beginner banjo player and trying to level up and become more intermediate. And I've been buying a lot of books and just even if I can get like one or two pages or one little trick out of the tabs that I can integrate it into my playing style, um, it's totally worth the price of admission, I think. Um, also, I'm the kind of personality that I actually like books. I know um, all the cool kids, you know, the 75-year-old cool kids online, um, they say they would rather have the oral tradition. And sure, that's great if you have a friend down the street who who plays claw hammer banjo. Um, that's kind of weird if you do, uh, and you're lucky. But uh, <laughs> most of us rely on YouTube or, or whatever. And YouTube is, is really rough to learn from because you get very spotty. You know, you watch a hundred different videos, a hundred different players of a, the same song, and you're going to get a hundred different ways of playing it. The melody might be completely different. The chords, the keys, they might be different, but they're all called the same song. And it's really um, challenging to, to take that apart. Tabs, for me, are great because it kind of um, standardizes it. Um, it's, I mean, it, I can fake a song. I mean, it's, it's easy to... And I'll post that and people say, what are the tabs? I don't know because I'm just kind of... I'm just playing off the chords. But, and, and that's all great, and it's especially great for jamming, and that doesn't go away. You need that skill. But if you want to learn new ways to make songs, and, and um, you know, for me, tabs are a great, great way to codify that. So anyway, I picked up this book today, and uh, a lot of you probably already have it. It's called Round Peak Style, uh, Claw Hammer Banjo by uh, Brad Leftwich, published by Mel Mel Bay, and um, what had happened is I'd seen a lot of this really rustic sounding banjo, you know, a lot of people had the scoop cut out of their banjo, out of the neck, and they were playing over the neck, creating this kind of wooden sound, stuffing the pot, giving it this kind of um, more wood, less metal, and uh, that's kind of, to me, it's, it's just a tone thing, it's really just a taste thing, but for me, I kind of liked it, and I was trying to figure out how these people get a certain kind of sound and um, when I play especially when I do drop thumb it turns to it's too delicate and too melodic and um, so if I play but it, the folks who were doing the round peak style they were kind of doing this cool like Yeah, but it's, it, it's hard to imitate it. So I'm trying to figure it out. But it, it's uh, it's half of its tone, but the uh, there's some technique to it also, which is um, so the tone they get by playing over the neck. But um, but there's a lot more pull off. Like they're real heavy with the, the pull offs. Um, and it's like I said in the last video, is to solve a problem of being able to play the notes down to play half notes sequentially, either up or down, that you couldn't do with your regular bum ditty. So if I wanted to um, strike the first string and then the second string right after that in an eighth note, I'd either have to go, you know, kind of do a roll, and an eighth note. So if I was going one, two, have to roll it and um, I thought that was bad so I get this book and there's a convention called rolls that's different than a brush a brush is a bunch of strings within one note but a roll is stretching out that but you're stretching out the, the brush slowly so so you can get your eighth notes that way uh, another thing this was also doing is um, was with the plucking so that you would, um, for example, I'm striking the uh, the second string first fret with my pointer finger, and then I pull off on that uh, first string. So it's, and it was funny because there's one measure here where it's literally it's just, and then they do the roll right after that. So it's. And 
of course you get good at it and you play it faster and it starts to really create a really interesting texture and uh, and I think that's a lot of what claw hammer banjo or the appeal of claw hammer banjo always was for me is is this texture that sort of it was a rhythm and it was a texture that kind of worked in the background behind maybe a fiddle player or whatever but you could also play some really cool melodies So there's another convention that I saw in this book also. They would do slides, and then when you slide from, for example, I'm sliding on this uh, third string from the second fret to the third. But when they would finish the slide, they, they pull the finger off of that fifth string. So it's... that's something I would never have done before you know basically being able to hit one string and and the thumb at the same time creating so it's the equivalent of doing a pinch so it's you can do that with a hammer-on and when you put it all together again it's it, it it's letting you do Pinches and eighth note runs up and down the strings. Essentially, it's letting you play anything you could probably find in a in a Scrug style tab, but with claw hammer technique. But without the odd part is it, it doesn't sound bluegrassy. It actually kind of sounds, um, you know, kind of that Appalachian or whatever the kind of the mountain sound that I particularly like and I've always been uh, seeking out. So. Anyway, just thought I'd share that.